to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. I am your host, Dr. Onit Lev, an emergency and addiction doctor who has served at the White House and still practices on the front lines. Right here on High Truths, you will learn from experts, hear stories from the emergency department, and listen to people who have struggled from addiction. Friends, fentanyl is plaguing America. It has infected all illicit drugs, from cocaine to meth, counterfeit pills, and even marijuana. If you are around someone who may be using drugs, you should carry naloxone, the opioid reversal agent. Carrying naloxone for drugs is like carrying an EpiPen for allergies. If you need a prescription for naloxone, you should have one, no questions asked. That is why I am offering a free prescription to anyone who needs one. Come visit me on hightruths.com to learn more about the show, submit a question, or download a free prescription for naloxone. And if you like the show, do me a favor. Give us a five-star review and subscribe. Your stars are very much appreciated and go a long way in supporting the program. This High Truths podcast is sponsored by NMI, the National Marijuana Initiative. NMI strives to dispel misconceptions about marijuana and raise awareness of the issues surrounding the drug so that citizens and policymakers can make well-informed choices regarding marijuana use and regulations. Learn more about NMI at thenmi.org. Follow the science. A presidential election was won based on the premise of following the science. We want people to follow the science when it comes to COVID. And if they don't, they can get canceled or deleted from social media. I had a patient who came to the emergency department with a long list of symptoms that he posted on Instagram and attributed to his COVID vaccine. He said that his post was deleted, but he saved it because he was very concerned and came to me with all these symptoms. I asked him to show it to me. I was very curious. And interestingly, his long list of symptoms clearly showed a lot of anxiety, but they were not due to his vaccine. And I was able to show him that they were not due to the vaccine in my skeptic patient using his own timeline. My diagnosis was cannabis hyperemesis syndrome and anxiety. Frankly, having his seen his Instagram posts blaming the COVID vaccine, I viewed it as a personal rant from someone who was very anxious. It was not a credible threat to the vaccination cause. Just so you know, I'm very much pro-vaccine. Last shift, I admitted a 98-year-old lady to the intensive care unit and another 30-year-old who were both had COVID pneumonia. And I was angry that these were people who could have been vaccinated and could have had spared them terrible hospitalization and possible death. As an emergency physician, I was first in line to get vaccinated and to get a booster. However, I believe that deleting this man's social media posts just caused him and others to be more paranoid and propagated the conspiracy thinking. People post non-factual things all the time, and this was just no different. In any case, we want people to follow the science for COVID, but we want to promote the science when it comes to marijuana as well. Not only do people post whatever they want about marijuana, companies can advertise miraculous health cures and benefits to marijuana and CBD with no checks and balances on fake news. Amazing how pot gets a free pass while anything negative about COVID vaccine gets canceled. I always said I was jealous of infectious diseases, and here's another example. There is unfair disparity in dealing with fake news about COVID compared to fake news about marijuana. And with that introduction, let's hear from one of my esteemed colleagues. Good day. My name is Clay Whiting. I'm a board-certified emergency medicine physician working my 19th year on the front lines. Thank you, Dr. Lev and the High Truths team for the opportunity to ask a question. Do you think the high potency of THC products available to anyone in the cannabis dispensaries is contributing to increased ED visits for cyclical vomiting, psychosis, and other mental health conditions, including SI? And if so, do you believe physicians should be advocating strongly for elected officials to pass legislation to restrict THC potency in order to protect our patients? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Whiting. 
and to answer your question, an addiction psychiatrist who is very familiar with THC potency. Dr. Elizabeth Stout retired from her work treating the most complex patients with a dual diagnosis of mental health and substance use disorder. And she ends her time educating on the deleterious effects of high potency THC on the developing brain and mental health. She has been one of the medical experts who successfully worked on passing marijuana protection reform in Colorado. Dr. Stout and I serve on the executive board of a new organization called Isaac, the International Academy on Science and Impact of Cannabis. Dr. Stout, welcome to High Truths. Thank you. Happy to be here. I am so excited for this uh, this discussion. Libby, you started your career as a psychiatrist. And how did that uh, come about to get you interested in the issue of marijuana? Well, I actually um, have been an addiction psychiatrist all this time. And I've run several treatment programs. And my last one, the one that was the longest, was a, a treatment program at the state hospital in Colorado. Pretty phenomenal program because it doesn't exist anywhere else in the country that I can find in the fact that it's 90-day inpatient treatment um, paid for by the state of Colorado. And so it's for people who have failed everything else. uh, And it primarily is for the people who have ended up having criminal charges. So people are there as a condition of probation, parole, diversion. But it is a voluntary program. And it's a dual diagnosis program. So it's for people with mental health problems and substance use problems. And so I've been doing that for the last 20 years. Uh, But in the last five years, I started seeing really significant problems with marijuana. And, you know, we in Colorado legalized medical in 2000, and I wasn't that worried about it. At the time, I thought, you know, it's just going to be like I've, I've been treating marijuana addiction forever. So it probably won't be much different. But with the high potency products, it has become a totally different story. And I started seeing people with really severe psychosis um, that was worse worse than methamphetamine in my experience. And so I started trying to convince people this was a problem, um, especially the patients and the people in the state. And nobody was really listening to me. Because we also have this issue that happened, they signed into a law that because it's medical, people on probation can still use medical marijuana. And so if they had a criminal charge due to substance use, like methamphetamine, heroin, alcohol, they had to stay sober from that while they were waiting to get into treatment, but they could continue to use medical marijuana. And of course, they're using these really high potency products that are causing all kinds of problems. And it didn't make any sense to me. But people would say, oh, well, it's just marijuana or it's med- it's medicine. It's medicine. It must be good. Wow. What? So can you give us an example? I think we say, oh, marijuana causes psychosis. And the fact that you said sometimes worse with meth- methamphetamine, that's such a powerful statement. And when you said that, it just I realized, you know, I see that as an emergency physician, I see that, but we, we, we want to dismiss it like, oh, maybe that's just their underlying mental health. But we've definitely seen patients who come in extremely agitated and the only drug screen that comes up is, is THC. Um, yeah. And so can you tell our audience, what, what does psychosis mean? What is it? And maybe give us an example. Okay. Well, psychosis is when people are thinking differently than normal people. Uh, So symptoms of psychosis are a sense of not reality. So people actually can hear voices that nobody else can hear. They see things that nobody else sees. And they become very paranoid. They think people are out to get them. And what I was finding most concerning was these severe delusional systems. Because once somebody develops a delusional system, it's really not treatable. Antipsychotics do not touch delusional systems. And so there's delusions of grandeur where, you know, they think everybody's watching them. And uh, and it's just, I I was starting to see that as, oh my gosh, that's incredible that this drug can cause that. And then what we would see, because I had a beautiful chance of keeping people for 90 days in the hospital where we know they're not getting any drugs Mm -hmm. and people would get better. And, and, And then 
you know, it, luckily we had them long enough that we actually convinced them, most of them, that they shouldn't go back to it. But then I would see people that do go back to it. And even though their psychosis is clear, now they're back to being psychotic again. And so I've seen several young people that developed a severe psychotic symptoms, couldn't stay away from it, and then it became permanent. And so it's, you know, they really basically turned into having schizophrenia, which is a devastating disease for many, many people. And I think you are, you know, what you are seeing in these um, very complex cases uh, in your practice has been verified in huge studies with a large amount of patients that we, we now see the connection of uh, intermittent psychosis from using that becomes into uh, chronic schizophrenia, which is so sad because it could be prevented. I, I shudder to think that you have people who are there in the justice system and they're allowed to use marijuana. We had a case in California of a, a, a woman who was given um, some uh, concentrates by her boyfriend and she ended up getting very paranoid and she stabbed him a hundred times and killed him from, from her, you know, this could be a very violent reaction. Yeah. And did you, did you did you see that in in this patient population? How often was psychosis and marijuana associated together? Very frequently, and it wasn't everybody for sure. But um, we we would have significant numbers, and then that was when I would ask the questions about what they were using, and it turned out yes, they're using these very high potency products. So they're dabbing. Like I worked with somebody who was dabbing 30 times a day. And that's a significant amount of THC and, you know, very high potent products. And I didn't used to see that because, as you know, in the olden times, <laughs> when we first legalized, I mean, the highest potency we had in 2000 was 5%. And we didn't have any concentrates at that time. And I wasn't seeing this kind of psychosis. I was seeing addiction. I mean, we've always known that marijuana has the potential for addiction. Um, and many people in the industry fight that. They don't want anybody to think that. Right. Um, what yeah. we're seeing we, with the higher potency is it's even more addicting. And that's, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 that's important to know that it, the potency level increases the addiction. Yes. And, and that's been well documented in the research. There are studies showing that, you know, when you get to potencies higher than 15%, it increases the addictive potential. We know that about all drugs. I mean, we've known this about the opiates for a long time. You get Oxycontin and that's much more addictive than codeine. Uh, and so anytime you... Uh, we knew that since uh, cigarettes, right? That's why the industry put in more nicotine to get absolutely. more customers, right? That's the same... That's exactly, uh, <laughs> yeah. Exactly right. And I think this is why they're fighting so much to, you know, all these states are now looking at, can we decrease the potency? Because we tried that in Colorado. And the industry fights that tooth and nail because that is how they keep people buying their product. And, yeah. and, and truly, you know, they're saying that nobody wants to make it anymore, the stuff that's low potency, because people don't want it. People want the high potency stuff. Right. Um, Dr. Whiting, uh, Clay Whiting is one of my esteemed colleagues in the emergency department. He ha has a question related to high potency THC. And he's asking if, is it the high potency that causes cyclical vomiting syndrome, cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, or what I call scrometing? And is it high potency that causes a psychosis? Is, is that the association? Yes, I absolutely do believe that. Uh, and you know, like the cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, that idiosyncratic reaction to cannabis has been around for centuries. I mean, I even found a report of it back in the like 1800s in the Middle East. So people have had this idiosyncratic reaction where they can get nauseated and vomit. Normally it's supposed to help with nausea and vomiting, but we're seeing such an increase, I think, because of the higher potency. And that's directly related to addiction. So the more somebody uses something, the more chance they become addicted to it and they can't stop and they're using more and more because their tolerance has increased. And I think that's why we're seeing so many um, cases of cannabis hyperemesis syndrome. And, and the problem is in people I've worked with, uh, it's, well, it's a really hard sell first 
to convince somebody that their symptoms are from their marijuana use. That's really hard. But once I've been successful in, you know, over a couple of months, them practicing and, you know, saying, okay, I think you're right. I think I need to quit now. Then they can't quit right. because they're so addicted to it. And that's yeah. really sad. Oh, well, people don't want to believe that they're addicted. I, when I, when I tell people who are there, you know, eight times already in their emergency departments, you know, eight CAT scans later that um, they, they like, oh no, I'm not addicted. I can quit. But I think I finally understand why they don't think that they're addicted because withdrawal from opioids or alcohol is so severe and withdrawal from cannabis is different. It's subtle. It's more um, anxiety. So they think you need more. So I think that that's why they don't understand that they are actually addicted and have withdrawal until I explain to them that, that if you're feeling anxious without it, that's what that's what addiction is. That's what withdrawal is. Yeah. In fact, you know, when when it was very low potency, less than 2%, we didn't really think it was addictive. I mean, it was classed as a hallucinogen because hallucinogens don't have a withdrawal syndrome. Right. Um, but now it's really basically in a class by itself because it, the higher potency has this really marked withdrawal syndrome and and the products have a very short half-life. So it's very similar to tobacco. So if anybody, you know, many people don't think they're addicted to tobacco until they try to quit. Mm -hmm. And then they realize they just, they can't quit because, you know, you have to smoke a cigarette every hour to keep the withdrawal symptoms at bay. Well, that's what we're starting to see with the high potency marijuana. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think a young person, like I said, would dab 30 times a day because they're, they're ha it's wearing off. And so then they're experiencing this anxiety and a lot of them get really angry. And, yes. and then when you're, when you're, um, you know, trying to convince them that it's the marijuana that's causing that, they just initially start using more because they just can't believe that. And that makes it worse. Right. You know what you say about how potency definitely makes sense. If we think of, you know, the beginning of our uh, medical career years ago, we'd have nobody come in the hospital or probably few into the mental health institution um, with uh, marijuana, you know, uh, scrometing or psychosis. And now we see it every single day. And what's different um, between then and, and now is the high potency, not just the numbers, because if it was not the high potency, we would have seen occasional cases, you know, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, but um, now we're seeing it, you know, regularly and, and it has to be because um, it, it's a different drug. It's not the same pot as it was years ago. Um, so we, there is definitely that's causing that. So can you explain what is high potency? What does that mean? Uh, you know, if you say, uh, hey, that's a high potent stuff, maybe that's attractive. Like, hey, I want to go and I want to buy that high potent stuff. <laughs> um, uh, what's the difference? Is it a smoked, edible, <laughs> content? Like what is yeah. it? Well, most of the well, most of the research, if you if you look at the research, uh, we do have research on marijuana for med medical conditions. Um, it's not great. There's not a lot of it, but on the stuff that's on researched on medic medicinal cannabis, like from a dispensary, the highest levels are 10% THC, and so most of the studies have been done on stuff less than 10%. And if you look at just in terms of milligram dosing, uh, the the different, most of the studies have been on the isolated cannabinoids, uh, like C or CBD. But if you look at those, then there's still like a maximum of 60 milligrams a day, or maybe a total of 140 milligrams a day. If you're looking at the Sativex studies where there, there's like 2.7 milligrams per of THC per in, inhalation of that drug. But, um, so that's all considered normal potency is anything less than 10%. Anything greater than 10% is then considered high potency. And the studies are coming in now on a regular basis. You know, initially the kind of the landmark studies on the on the addiction and the high potency came out of the UK where they were looking at 15% or higher causing um, increased risk of psychosis or addiction. And they found that, you know, using the stuff that's 15% or higher, increased the psychosis three times. And if they were using it daily, increased it five times. But then and, that was kind of replicated in multiple sites um, in, in, 
in Europe, and they they then looked at 10%. And they said anything greater than 10% was increasing the risk of psychosis similarly. And so I really think right now, anything higher than 10% should be considered high potency. Can you even buy low potency? <laughs> Can I go say, oh, I just want the 5% kind? Well, no, <laughs> that's that's something <laughs> I've tried with patients because yeah. in the harm reduction model, when I was working, you know, with somebody who, you know, especially people that had safety sensitive positions and they're driving for a job and yeah. I know that they're smoking on a daily basis. And of course, they're trying to tell me, oh, they're only doing it at night. So it's not when they're driving. <laughs> and, and, and I hear they're smoking, you know, the plant is 22%. So I say, well, okay, if you can't stop, how about if you go to the store and get the stuff that's 5% or less than 10%? Right. The the filtered cigarettes. And then <laughs> come back the and unfiltered. tell me it's not available. They can't find it. Yeah. 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 Wow. So have things changed? So Colorado, one of the or the first state, right, to pass medical marijuana, or no, California was. But Cal yeah. Colorado passed it, uh, medical marijuana in 2010. 2010, 12 years ago, did the potency um, of THC change in, in those 10 years? Yeah. So we actually passed medical in 2000. And then um, we didn't get the concentrates until 2010. So that's when they started to increase potency is 2010. That's after that Ogden memorandum where they said that they wouldn't prosecute states that had medical marijuana laws. And, and uh, then, so now our average potency in the plant is 20% THC, but we do have people saying that they have plants that are 30%, even up to 40% THC. And then our average concentration, uh, average THC potency in the concentrates is about 69%. But we have concentrates that go all the way up to 90, 99.9% .9 pure THC. So it's it's just been this massive increase in potency with no regulations. I mean, that's like that's amazing. astounding, right? So we yeah. passed it, you know, in 2000. That's a long time ago. It's not even the same products anymore. And yet, you know, there's no checks and balances on what's happening to people's health and people's lives. Right, right. We were able to get a law passed this past session in Colorado starting to address some of these problems um, is just specifically addressing concentrates. And uh, so we were able to limit the amount people are able to purchase. However, we were not able to get a potency cap because the industry fought it so hard. And, and the legislators that were carrying the bill didn't want to try and fight that. What were you asking for? Less than 15%. Right. Which... You yeah. know, I encourage states now if they're going to do that to do 10 percent. <laughs> but um, it's just it's really, really difficult. And the industry saying it, well, it would be too difficult to do that because they, you know, they can't. It would be too costly. It wouldn't be costly. It would be bad for business. People want. That. <laughs> <laughs> that's why it would be costly for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess that's true. Yeah. So, but yes. you, you, you were able to do things, um, Libby, I'm so like envious of the things that you're able to do in, in, in Colorado, you were able to pass yeah. some reform and some consumer protection, um, regarding marijuana. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Uh, one of the biggest pieces was that we were able to get this, what they called in the bill it was a tangible evidence of the harms. And so it's a piece of paper that actually now has turned into be four pages. Uh, it's a handout that everybody in a dispensary who's purchasing a product is supposed to be given. And it actually shows the um, typical serving size of like a dab, which is actually a pencil point on the piece of paper. So it's a tiny little pencil point. It's you know less than half a grain of rice. And then it lists the risks. So the risks are that if you use this product, you're risking the possibility of experiencing psychosis, mental health problems, cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, and addiction or cannabis use disorder. So that was a big thing. We wanted to get suicide in there because we think the literature definitely supports that, but that was also fought by the industry. 
Uh, and so we didn't get suicide in there, but we got those other things in there. And that's a good thing. We also got limits on what people could purchase in a day. It's still a massive amount. I just, you know, before this law passed, people with a medical card could actually purchase 40 grams a day, 40 grams of product. So like shatter comes in a one gram bag. And if it's 76% THC, that means there's 760 milligrams of THC in this one bag. And you can do 40 of those. Uh, I mean, that's like incredible. So now it's down to eight. An adult can purchase eight. And then the biggest concern we had with this bill was addressing the young people, especially the people 18 to 20, who in Colorado can get medical cards without parental consent or knowledge. And then they could purchase 40 grams a day. And so now the 18 to 20 year olds can only purchase 20, uh, two grams which is still a massive amount of THC. Well, if you think about this, the research. Yeah. I, I, I mean, your brain is still growing till 25. You shouldn't be purchasing anything. There's no reason for a kid or someone whose brain is not fully developed to be buying marijuana, period. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, and so that was a big part of the reason that this bill passed and it passed bipartisan um, overwhelmingly wow. uh, in both House and Senate. And the real reason that happened is we had so many family members testifying about the downsides of this, these products and what, how it's devastated their children and it's devastated their family, how many people they've lost to suicide how many people have lost to psychosis, you know, how much money families are spending on treatment. Um, that's phenomenal. And you know, treatment is not cheap. And no. people are, you know, spending yeah, we're finding, like savings trying to get their kids healthy. It's a number one, marijuana is the number one drug found in um, drug poisonings in kids under the age of five. Like, you know, babies are getting into this a lot. Um and uh, I copied Colorado because you had a statistic about that's the number one drug in, um, I think it was uh, people under the age of 18 uh, for suicide, number one drug found in completed suicides in younger people. And uh, so I did the same kind of analysis uh, locally for age under 25, because I want to take the science age of the growing brain, not the, the legal age. Yeah. Um, and so 25 and younger, again, the same, same as Colorado, the number one, more than alcohol, the number one drug found in completed suicides is, uh, was marijuana. Um, yep. you, you mentioned about medical marijuana and people who are in, in justice involved who are still using medical marijuana. What, what does that mean? What is medical marijuana? Well, I actually think it's a farce right now. I'm sorry to say. Because it's not anything like was studied in the literature for medical use. Uh, as I said, we have research on stuff that's less than 10%, but we have absolutely no research on the stuff that's 15 and higher. And that's all that's available. If you look, and there was a really nice study done by this group who went to the different states and looked at what was available in dispensaries. And in Colorado, and as in many of the states, overwhelmingly, all of the products are more than 15%. And there is no research at all demonstrating these are efficacious or safe for any medical condition. But we have thousands of research studies showing the dangers of these high potency products. And still we allow industry to heavily market and advertise them as medicine. And so many, many people believe they're medicine. Well, people want to say that, oh, we just don't have enough research. I mean, we do have research. In fact, uh, there, there is a lot of research happening with government funding, but I don't think there's ever going to be research done on these higher potency products that's legitimate, like randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trials, because I don't think an IRB would ever pass it. I, oh, I don't no. think, I don't that, would think be, IRB... that would be illegal. That'd be like, like you know, Nazi war crime type of <laughs> <laughs> medical experimentation. You would never be allowed to do that. Yeah. Um, to give and, somebody something that you know can cause them such a violent outburst. Um, but yeah, I, I 
I was saying that I think the the medical community, really the word medical has been hijacked because, mm. you know, we had to go to medical school a long time, I keep getting board exams and testing. And, and for me, just to, I would, I would lose my life sense if I gave a prescription for amoxicillin without, you know, getting a history and vital signs and a physical exam and checking other drug interactions. And they just kind of hijacked this word and called it medical. There's no difference in the plant. It's not like this plant has medical grade quality versus this one is recreational. Um, I'd rather have them just call it all recreational instead of um, pretending um, and, and really you know, in, insulting my profession by calling it a medicine. I agree. I agree completely. And yeah. one of the things I really wanted to see in our law that didn't happen, I really wanted to see it on the PDNP or the Prescription Drug Monitoring Program. Yeah. And there are eight states. I learned there are eight states now who are doing it and even more that are considering that if you're going to call it medical, it should be in the prescription drug monitoring system. So you could see, you know, we're going to check if you're taking your opioids appropriately and your benzodiazepine and coordinate as a doctor, you want to coordinate medication. So if, if you're getting medical marijuana, I should know that before I give you opiates or other things. Yes, and because I would frequently see people who were referred to me because their medication isn't working. You know, they're they're depressed, anxious, and they're on psychiatric medication. And so they're referred to me because the medication isn't working. And then I found out that they're on, you know, mar medical marijuana. So they have medical marijuana card and they're using it. And I'm trying to explain to them that you know, this drug drug interactions, these marijuana can cause or worsen depression or anxiety. And I'm explaining that to them. And I want to talk to the physician who has recommended the marijuana for them. Um, because like one young person I remember, uh, I saw coming out of the hospital after a suicide attempt. And this person, uh, they didn't get the history in the hospital. They just diagnosed this person with bipolar disorder and put them on a lot of medication. And I get this person and I get the history that they're vaping 60% hash every single day. And I said, what, what is that for? Oh, that's right. It's for my migraine headaches. And I said, well, number one, I've never heard of any research that says that that's effective for that at that potency. Did the doctor actually tell you that? Well, no, it was really the bud tender <laughs> that told me that. And so then I want to know, well, who's the doctor? I'd like to talk to the doctor. They don't even know. They saw him one time. They don't have yeah. their name. And, and, and the requirement was it is just to see them once a year to get their card renewed. And, yeah. and, and that's why I was really trying to push for it to be on the PDMP. But. Right. And coordinate. I, I think that that's a good, it just makes you, the PDMP um, makes you a better doctor. Because then you yeah. get to see, you're, you're able to advocate for your patients. You could see, because patients go to different places, not, you know, regardless of marijuana. And it gets you like to, to coordinate that, especially during a behavioral health unit admission. That's time to make sense of all the different medicines that you're taking. And okay, let's, let's, let's coordinate. Let's do this better. Because sometimes the medications themselves can be a problem, uh, yeah, like you meant. Exactly. So are there, are there really psychiatrists who say, I had a patient who came in, in florid psychosis, bipolar disorder. And she told me that her psychiatrist said she should use marijuana to help her relax. Is, is, can you imagine a psychiatrist saying that? Or, well, I mean, I don't know if that was I, I, I can't. I cannot. However, <laughs> I believe there must be people doing that. There must be. Because I, except that, you know, I take that back, that people that I finally figured out who was writing the recommendations for them mm -hmm. were not in the same field. Like mostly it was um, retired urologist or an anesthesiologist. Yeah, I've, I mean, I've these met are people some of these doctors. Recommendations they, for something that's totally out. Yeah, I met a physician like that and he goes, you know, I, I they pay me, you know, 10 grand a month to, to do this. Of course I do that. It's like, well, how many people are you hurting? <laughs> yeah. I, I just right. So does is there is there as a psychiatrist, as an addiction psychiatrist, is there any um truth into the claim that is commonly seen that marijuana helps calm you down, helps PTSD, um, helps you sleep? Is is there any truth to any of that? Uh, of course there is. It's it's very temporary. 
So it's, it's, it's um, like PTSD is a really great example. Of course it works. Uh, of course it works just like alcohol works, just like benzodiazepines work. What they do is they numb you. And so when you're under the influence, you're not experiencing the intrusive symptoms of PTSD. But in order to keep those symptoms at bay, you have to use every day, sometimes all day long. And then you're set up for the addiction cycle. And then you're set up for increased risk for psychosis. PTSD in itself can cause psychosis so that this can worsen the psychosis. And so this is why the studies are not panning out. And most of the studies have shown that people get worse with marijuana, with PTSD. But initially, yes, it does seem to work. And, and there are people that you know swear by it, that it saved their life, and they don't think there's anything wrong with it. However, I then challenge those people will then try and quit. And then they find out that they can't quit because they're now dependent on it. And so it's very similar to tobacco. I mean, a lot of people initially start smoking to help calm them down. <laughs> And then once you're addicted, you're in withdrawal all the time. And so you're anxious all the time. And the only time you're not anxious is the five minutes that you're smoking. And then it wears off and then you're you're anxious again. And so, um, yeah, of course, they, they do work. That's what I tell people. Anything that works immediately should warn you that's addictive. So... Anything you take, that it, it does exactly what you want it to do right away. That's a scary thing. Right. And if you think that's true for, again, the cigarette model, alcohol model. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, that can that can lead to vicious situs. I, I really worry about uh, our veterans and people who are pushing that on them because they, they've served our country. And they deserve the very best medical uh, care and not to be used as guinea pigs to 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 promote a, uh, an industry. We did that to our veterans with cigarettes. I mean, now we're, we want to do that with marijuana. It's it's um yeah. Sad. yeah well, there was there was this highly anticipated research study that was done recently where they compared they were using dispensary cannabis. Well, I think they still got it from Mississippi. But they were looking at high potency THC versus low potency THC versus high potency CBD or a mix of THC, CBD, mm -hmm. and then looking at PTSD symptoms. And it didn't show any difference. So there was no difference from placebo. Yeah, so. but that's probably only part of the story because what I noticed in these studies is that they don't report how many people dropped up because of negative side effects. Yeah. Yeah. And that's very important to to, yeah. Yeah. to point out. Um, so anything else you think our listeners should really know from an addiction psychiatrist and the issue of uh, cannabis? Well, it's uh, the, the biggest concern is really with our young people and um, trying to educate young people so that they don't start down this road. Because we do know that if you start before, you know, your brain is fully developed, then it's really worse. So I think that if people could just say, all right, well, I'm just going to wait until I'm 25 and then I'll try it because then it's probably OK. And then you probably won't feel the need to do all this high potency stuff. But I don't know. Yeah. Keep them alive till they're 25, you know, protect that growing brain. I think that's yeah. probably the number one message because that'll translate not just for marijuana. It'll translate for other drug use and other types of addiction as well, if we can protect the growing brain, we would have less addiction of all uh, chemicals in, in in the United States. Right. And, and because I absolutely, this is a gateway drug. I mean, mm -hmm. I cannot believe people say it's not a gateway drug. We have three gateway drugs. They are alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. And it really depends on which one you use first, which becomes then the gateway to the other drugs. And it's basically on how these affect the brain and the brain chemistry. Yeah. And and so they do definitely cause people to then feel comfortable to try the next thing. And since we have done such a good job about tobacco, we have less people actually using tobacco and we've done a good job about, about alcohol, you know, warning people about the hard alcohol. 
But because we have said marijuana is a medicine and it's safe, we have more kids starting with that one. And so that becomes the gateway drug, which then convinces them that it's okay to continue to try something. Yeah, better. I definitely see it. I, I uh, Time and time again, I see patients in the emergency room, they coming in to get MAT, medication assisted treatment for their opiate use disorder. And I ask them, well, how old were you when you started? And they'll be like, oh, I started 21. And it's like, well, that was when you started heroin. When were you, were you first, first used any drugs? And they'll say, oh, marijuana. Uh, no, well, that was just pot at age 12 or 13. And time and time again, Every patient, I haven't met a single patient who uses fentanyl or overdose from fentanyl that didn't start with um, marijuana. And then if anything, marijuana is the gateway to tobacco use because we've we finally curbed, uh, you know, cigarette use. And now the gateway to cigarettes is from is from marijuana. It's very interesting. Absolutely. That's absolutely true. Yeah. And that's so sad. Yeah. And so, Louie, I'm very excited to be working with you on Isaac, the uh, International Academy on Science and Impact of Cannabis. We both serve on the board together and maybe you want to share with our listeners some of the exciting things we're doing together. Wow, I, I think it's great that you guys really put this together. I mean, you're instrumental in getting this going. And it's it's really doctors trying to educate doctors and everybody else. Uh, we have a really great... Um, expert seminar series. Uh, we've had some awesome um, people presenting. You know, a lot of it is, you know, the science behind it, but I really liked our most recent uh, presentation, Emily Klein talking about motivational interviewing and how um, families can use that and has, has a great website that's for free that people can look up and learn some things. So I think that's going to be really, really helpful for a lot of people. Yeah, I think that we have the lecture series. It's free for anybody who um, signs up the same day. Um, I'm proud of the medical library that really is a resource for anybody who wants to learn. They don't have to be a doctor. We, we took up the medical literature and we translate it into a way that any anybody can go click and understand and have a resource um, yeah. to the science. And uh, we have an exciting meeting coming up with the United Nations um, Office on, of Drugs. Uh, and they asked us to talk about that. So I'm looking forward to that as well. Yeah, that's great. And closing, uh, advice for our caller, Dr. Clay Whiting. Do you have any words of wisdom to Dr. Whiting? You just got to keep persevering and telling people and trying to convince them that this is what's causing their problem. Because the solution like for cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome is to quit. And when people actually quit, um, they get better. There are, uh, like I always give people the reference to the Facebook pages that are support groups for CHS. Uh, and I encourage people to look at those. They're amazing. There's this one called Recovery from Cannabinoid Hyperemesis Syndrome. Uh, and it's thousands of people worldwide that are supporting each other, helping each other. And Dr. Dr. Whiting is an amazing colleague of mine. I. Uh very much enjoy the privilege of working with him and and he likes to get me riled up he'll send me cases you know the, this person overdosed on fentanyl what can we do and and uh, he'll you know and then I'll, I'll act on that real-time information of what he's seeing in the emergency department and you know translate that into action of what can we do in the community to prevent that i love that that partnership and advocacy that Dr. Whiting has. And Libby, thank you so much for joining me here on High Truths and sharing your knowledge as an addiction psychiatrist with our audience and for your work with Isaac and the community. I really much appreciate it. And I wish you a lot of success and a lot of wonderful joint projects in the future together. Thank you. I really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you for listening to High Truths on Drugs and Addiction, where national experts bring you facts and answer your questions. This week's episode would not be possible without the generous support from our sponsors. A sincere and warm thank you to NMI, the National Marijuana Initiative, striving to dispel misconceptions about marijuana so citizens and policymakers can make well-informed choices. Our producer is Dave Rivas from Davy Boy Productions. I am your host, Dr. Ronit Lev. We hope we brought your day a little bit more high truths.